Some got hopes and dreams, we got ways and means, the supreme dream team, always up with the scheme, from Hellcat to selling raps, name the theme, Mirage to the top, floating on the screen, who the hell wanna stop me, I hated those who got me, a million refugees with unlimited warranties, Black Caesar, they ain't top teethers, diplomat immediately, no time for a visa, they just do guns, I'ma shoot them one by one, got five sides to me, something like a pentagon. All right, evening everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Let me get Kish on to unmute you guys. Let's get Ali on. Okay, so evening, welcome evening, on Monday, 29th of June. 10 weeks we're running now. Uh, it's the final of Monday Night Live. And good to see everyone. I hope everyone is keeping well and is keeping safe as well. Uh, most of us now are back in practice, uh, pretty much full swing. Uh, we can see Ali has been with the AGP look, uh, with a nice new clean shaven look as well. Kish, what is happening with you? You haven't shaved yet. This is this is one day's growth, bro. One day's growth. Fantastic. Yeah, not back yet. <laughs> so today is the last session. It has been a fantastic ten weeks. When we first started out, uh, we were pretty much trying to keep everyone together, keep the positivity whilst getting big lecturers uh, on topics that we all want to learn about. And I will say it's been a fantastic last ten weeks. Kish, how's it been for you? It's been, it's been an amazing time in terms of, as you said, it's been 10 weeks, time has flown. Um, I know that most people are now looking forward to the 4th of July when restaurants are opening up again. But it's crazy how fast time has gone. And like you said, we started this process off 10 weeks ago. It was just to bring a whole community together, spread the knowledge, spread the love. And, you know, it's gone so fast. I've had a really good time doing these Monday Night Lives. Sad it's coming to an end tonight, but we're kicking it, we're ending it in style with you two boys. So we've had 10 webinars, 17 lecturers, uh, over 10,000 dentists, uh, undergraduates, therapists, technicians have signed up for our courses, over 44 different countries. So it was initially, it was meant to be an international series. It's truly become an international series. And if you missed any of our videos, if you missed any of the lectures, they are all available on our YouTube channel, or if you go to the website, every single webinar is available for you as well. But we wanted to go out with a bang, and today we've got a fantastic session ready for you all today as well. And I'm proud and privileged uh, to be here with my partner in crime, uh, Dr. Ali Chohan, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen, heard of, have seen about, looking 10 years younger today. Ali, how are you, buddy? You good today? <laughs> I'm really well. Yeah, I yeah. uh, uh, had a clean day, but uh, uh, I'll take that as a compliment, I suppose. Ali, you're sounding like a transformer. <laughs> Ali, can you hear us, bro? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. You, you sound like Optimus Prime. You're, you're oh, okay. <laughs> cutting out a bit. Yeah, you know what? Let me just, uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll uh, reach, uh, reconnect with the internet. It should be okay. So whilst Ali's reconnecting, uh, again, if any of you guys have got any questions over the last webinars, if you want any advice, support, any help at all, myself, Kish, and the whole Smile team is available. Uh, we've got our mentor on the group today, uh, Sumir Khan as well. I know he's uh, available to help anyone out. And that is the most important thing, support each other, that way we will all grow as a community together as well. Those of you who have not heard, we are doing a Janos Mako live full day session next Saturday. So we've got a number of you signed up already. Uh, it's gonna be a six hour full day teaching uh, session on anterior morphology and occlusion. So again, if anyone's interested, drop us a message. We will get that uh, set up for you guys and help you and uh, direct you. Also, we are still waiting on dates when Janos can come to the UK uh, based on just the quarantine regulations in the country. So as soon as we got that, we'll let everyone know and release the names of the winners of the morphology uh, molar occlusion as well. So Kish. What's happening? Can you hear us here? Ali, you I can hear you. Yeah, I'm, I, I can hear you all and uh, hopefully my internet connection's better. Yeah, much better. Sounds a lot better, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So were you cut off it before Ali? How have you been keeping? You been keeping well? Yeah, I've been keeping well. Uh, I've tried to, uh, you know, what well, I've uh, uh, Kish has been my inspiration, you know, after his uh, six pack photo. So I've uh, tried to, uh, I've actually got a diet plan made uh, and uh, I've uh, started uh, following a diet to uh, trim up and lose some weight. So uh, rather than looking like a fat 17 year old, I'd rather look like a healthy 30 year old. So yeah. <laughs> I love that. And how has work been? Been keeping well? Yeah, works well. Uh, so yeah, I've been uh, obviously, uh, I've got a couple of roles. I've been doing lots of online teaching um uh, for uh health education england uh, do it all over the country uh, uh i've had a lot of uh, days there uh and i've uh, i'm also a clinical advisor to nhs england so been doing 24 on uh, hour on call shifts a week so um to manage the complex cases uh during complete lockdown uh so in east of england so um that's kept me really busy during this uh, lockdown so it hasn't i wouldn't say i've not been I mean, uh, yeah, clinically, I've been off, hands-on, but otherwise, my other jobs have definitely kept me more busy. And one thing I've got to say, obviously, with what's happened with COVID and the NHS, the east of England, where the majority of our practices are based as well, I've got to say to you guys and the team, uh, did a fantastic job, and even the CDO uh, commended you guys on the east of England uh, with what you guys did to spearhead the whole setup and the leadership you showed. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I work with a, a absolutely fantastic team. Okay, so I work with Tom Norfolk, uh, Nicholas Lamb, Richard Lawson, Andy Furness. They, uh, my mentors. I'm obviously new to the job. It's I've been in three years, right? Uh, uh, and they really showed true leadership, set the whole thing up, and they were working like six, seven days a week. Okay, and all of this was like it's for free. We don't get paid extra for it. We're commissioned to do one day's worth of work a week, but all the work extra. Uh, to set the thing up and getting the clinical triage service up uh, that was all on a voluntary basis and i'm lucky to be part of that team so yeah definitely it was uh, uh, very very I, I was just led well by them so yeah it was great, grateful to be it was part great to of that see team. that it was yeah. great to see that as well Ali, because i know that obviously we are primarily a healthcare service and yeah. to see you guys leading from the front do putting those shifts in as nhs workers it was really really commendable and yeah. i think that helped us kind of inspire all of our associates and practices to do the same, especially as Jin said, most of them are in the East of England. So, was, so thank you very much for that. No, no, absolute pleasure, man. Like I said, it's a great team and they, they just straight away, as soon as this happened, they start setting it up and the structure and everything. And we all played our role, but uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's mainly Nick, Andy and Tom, they did most of the work, uh, but yeah. But I mean, I was part of the team, so I'm grateful to be it. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Now, today we're going to be discussing the jump. We're jump, yeah. discussing communication skills, NLP, and patient management. It's a topic myself and Ali are very, very passionate about. Uh, we've both been working in practice over 13 years now, working yeah. together since day one, lecturing for the past 10 years as well. And Ali, how important, even especially with your new role, or not your new role, last couple of years uh, as a clinical advisor, how important is communication skills? I mean, look, I, I, so, I mean, communication skills is, is, I would say for me has been the foundation, right? So, uh, and I'll discuss the role, okay? I mean, I initially started off as uh, um, someone with very poor communication skills. I'm not someone with natural gift of the gab like Jin. okay? So, you know, I'm not a natural charmer either, got more of a dry personality, uh, I, I can't speak well. Public speaking is not something that comes to me naturally. So these are all skills that I've learned and these can be taught. Okay, and these can be learned very easily. It just requires practice. And that's what we're going to be sharing today. But in terms of communication skills, I mean, look, uh, was, uh, part of my other job as a clinical advisor is to review complaints. Okay, and majority of the complaints that we review are all down to, you know, uh, the dentist said this, the dentist didn't explain the charges. I could have had this on the NHS. I could have, I should have been referred. Uh, the dentist never explained this to me. Dentist never explained I had gum disease. The tooth could have been lost. They hardly ever, I've hard, I've yet to receive a complaint where, you know, for example, the dentist tried to take a tooth out and I ended up in hospital. Okay. Or dentist tried to do a root canal, ended up in, a, uh, in the hospital due to, uh, you know, hypochlorite incident. You don't hardly get them complaints, okay? It's mainly 
uh, I mean, I'd read before is 70% of the complaints are down to communication skills. In my experience so far, I would say it's probably more. It's about 80 to 90%. Uh, and uh, I mean, the thing is, most of us dentists are okay at communication skills, but we need to be able, to, we need to improve them. Okay. And the simple reason is by the time we finish studying dentistry, we've learned 5,000 words plus. Okay. So that's like a new language. Right, so we are fluent in a completely new language, a different language. So when we're speaking, we're speaking gibberish to the patients, and uh, it's the whole idea is, uh, especially once I did my NLP practitioner training, okay, which is neurolinguistic programming, I came to understand how we confuse patients, and for me, it was very difficult to accept the fact that my patients were leaving confused, or I was getting complaints because of me. It's not, it wasn't the patient's fault. It is coming from me. The confusion is coming from me. And uh, that's what my journey's taken me on. And hopefully we can share this and, um, uh, you know, get across some techniques which can help us all. So whilst Ali loads up the presentation, today we're going to give away everything we've learned and every secret we have, we're going to give it to you guys. And yeah. the same way, I mean, we teach clinical skills, crown prep, yeah. composite, same way, you learn a skill and you go practice it. These skills are learned skills which you need to practice. So Ali, myself, Kish, we're going we're gonna to teach you all the skills we've learned, uh, everything we've picked up with evidence as well. So I'm going to let Ali load up the presentation. Kish, I was waiting for you to introduce us like normal. <laughs> well, then you guys don't need much of an introduction. <laughs> the Jim and Ali show. You actually want me to do an introduction, yeah? That's <laughs> So, okay, guys, uh, in terms of the presentation today, okay, uh, it's called The Jump, and we've named it The Jump because uh, it's taking ourselves to uh, the next level, okay, and it's improving ourselves. And we started off, you know, been teaching NLP and teaching communication skills for a while now, but it's becoming more and more holistic because I've now been recently asked to deliver at conferences uh, how we can use NLP to uh, basically improve our performance as a dentist and for self-improvement and for stress management. Okay. And especially with COVID at the moment. Okay. That is absolutely key. Okay. Uh, we really need to understand our and the things that we can do to be healthy. And that of course, in effect, our, uh, affects our communication skills. Um, and like Jin said, okay, today's course is evidence-based techniques that you can use right away. Okay, we're not gonna, we're not holding anything back. Okay, it's straight away. It's actually the straight content you can use straight away, uh, and it's for free. And the idea is just to, you know, it avoids uh, complaints. It helps you uh, improve your mental health and your uh, brain processing powers and patient management. Okay, that's the whole idea. Uh, of uh, today. So these are the things we're going to be covering today. We're going to start off with some communication skills, okay, basics of it and the theory of it, go into some patient management, how we can use that, and some NLP coaching to improve our brain functions and how we can use it for our learning, especially with the, all the courses we've done and all the courses we um, you know, are, are yet to come as well, how you can uh, basically process and use your brain uh, to do that. NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Okay, neurons, our brain, it, it, you know, we need to look at our chemistry, brain chemistry, brain health. Linguistic is how we use our language, the words, the thoughts, and programming is the process to function, you know. So basically, how we can use our language and words to process someone's brain or our brain to uh, create a function. Okay, that's what NLP is. Created by Dr. Bandler and John Grinder. Uh, and I was, uh, I was trained under Dr. Mandler himself. So I've been trained by the founder of uh, uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Why is this important? Okay, so this is a study that Jin and I love to, you know, uh, share. And this was something for me, uh, which is, you know, crucial for us to understand and accept is 85% of our financial success is due to skills in human engineering. And NLP is a very simple, rather than going doing a PhD in one of these subjects, okay, NLP is a very basic course and very basic common sense skills you can pick up 
and it's all around human engineering. Okay, and your personality and ability to communicate, negotiate, and lead, shockingly, only constitutes 15%. Okay, uh, so we need to be aware of this. And the Nobel Prize winner, okay, this is another thing that I learned, okay, from a psychologist called Daniel Kahneman, is that people would rather do business with a person that they like and trust rather than someone they don't even if the likable person is offering a lower quality product or a service at a higher price. Okay, and this is linking on to last week's lecture. Okay, people will come to us if they like us, but we can make ourselves more likable. That's the whole idea behind uh, today. Okay, we, so the first- This course, we call it the jump. When we're going from A levels to undergrad, we're making a jump and learning new skills. When you're going from undergrad to even doing DFT training, that's another jump and we're learning clinical skills. Even when you go from undergraduate to become an associate or you go for speciality training, you're learning more skills, more clinical skills. But the one thing we lack to learn is the communication skills, the skills that we need to actually thrive. And if, if uh, the study Ali talked about, only 15% of our success in practice is actually technical uh, knowledge technical ability. 85% of our success is, uh, as Ali said, on human engineering, our personality, how we communicate. So, and this is something which we learned, I mean, earlier on, none of us actually spend time or money on courses or reading books, learning on these skills. And again, Ali has spent a lot of time, uh, not just with the NLP, with Richard Bandler, uh, we've done PG certs in leadership, coaching, mentoring, uh, dental education, uh, all these skills and all this uh, knowledge we've learned, we put in today's presentation, which we're going to share with you guys today as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it, not only that, look, Jin, my, uh, you know what, in terms of communication skills, it really needs to be taught more, okay, uh, and more practically at university and in higher education as well. Uh, and I think it'll avoid a lot of complaints, okay, and us as dentists, uh, we pick up things very quickly, that's for sure, okay, so... Uh, if we're taught it, we'll pick it up very quickly. Very smart people, uh, you know, as a general cohort, it's quite a smart, uh, we're full of smart people. So the first thing we're going to go into, okay, is for us, uh, NLP content. We know this, okay, but this is just an NLP uh, uh, technique or category, okay? We all have a preferred system of learning, okay? So either we're visual either we're kinesthetic, which is feelings, touch, we're auditory digital, where we would like to talk to ourselves, or we're, you know, uh, auditory, okay? So we need to figure out what we are, okay? And we need to figure out what our patients are, okay? Or what our colleagues are, or even more importantly, what our partner is, boyfriend is, girlfriend is, husband or wife is, okay? And, uh, you know, quite often the sentences that will give this away is like, you know, uh, visual is see you soon. Or as a patient, that looks really painful. You know, that looks dreadful. I don't like the look of that. These are all visual statements. They're telling you what they are. Okay. The auditory is, uh, Ali, that sounds really painful. I hate the sound of the drill. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds nice. These are all auditory. Their preferred system, brain's mechanism, is auditory. Kinesthetic is, I hate that feeling. You know, I hate the feeling of the drilling. Okay, uh, keep in touch. Okay, and generally speaking, in general, okay, uh, majority of the guys, majority of male population is visual. Okay, and women is either auditory or kinesthetic. And the minority is auditory digital. Okay, that's in general. But obviously, we can figure out what each person is. Okay, so that's the first thing. So when we're doing, what we want to try to find out is when we're talking to our patients is what their preferred system is. And like I said, guys, this is not for just patients. Okay, this is for our, in our daily, day-to-day -day life. Okay, find out what your boyfriend is. Find out what your girlfriend is. Do you know what they are? Okay, and that's why quite often we'll figure out that there's a, you know, uh, quite often girls will say to guys, you know, you don't understand me. You don't understand uh, what, where I'm coming from or there's a, 
you know, a difficulty in the communication and most of it is down to this. Okay, uh, moving on to the next thing. Okay, so we're going to go straight into the communication skills. Okay, the first and foremost thing that Jin and I have learned, okay, when we did coaching, when we did PG cert in dental education, okay, uh, when we did mentoring, when I did hypnotherapy training, okay, most important skill in communication skills is listening. Okay, so what we need to do when we're listening is we need to do a couple of things. Number one is not to interrupt when the patient is speaking. So when the patient walks in, don't interrupt them, okay? Let them speak, okay? And with now, with all the PPE going on, there's not much point us talking, you know, with the FFP3 going on, okay, and the full visor and everything, it's very difficult for us to be communicating. So majority of it needs to be listening. Uh, we, even if we're having virtual consultations, allow the patient to listen because we only learn when we're listening. By speaking, we don't learn anything new. Okay, by listening, we learn something new. And we need to watch out for the statements as we discussed before. Can you identify what the preferred system is? Okay, are they visual? Are they kinesthetic? Are they auditory? Okay, remember the proportion. Okay, we've got two ears and one mouth. Okay, and as Prof taught us, that's a very good proportion for us to remember. Okay, it's a God's proportions. Let's keep it like that. Okay, listen twice as much speak as half as much okay that's what he said so uh we need to remember that but a couple of important tips in listening okay can you understand what their preferred system is and allow them to speak on average okay language showed in 2002 that average complaint lasts 92 seconds and the average time it takes the dentist to get uh fed up is 15 seconds okay so we're fed up six fold fold over by the time you know uh, the patients uh, finish their complaint. And, you know, I mean, it's quite often you walk into practices, okay, uh, the patient comes in, I've got a raging toothache, I can't sleep at night. Even the nurse has started filling out the prescription form. Okay, the nurse is, next thing, dentist is going to ask, are you medically fit and well, allergic to anything? As soon as they say no, 500 milligram amoxicillin is already filled out on the prescription form, okay? So even the nurse is no within 20 seconds, but we get fed up. So we get fed up very quickly, but we must allow them to listen. And the psychology behind listening is it's the greatest complaint that present society has. Okay. My wife doesn't listen to me. My husband doesn't listen to me. Boyfriend doesn't listen to me. Brother doesn't listen to me. Okay. Um, or, you know, it depends. Uh, my kids don't listen to me. My son doesn't listen to me. So that is a general complaint. So you must be someone who provides that service okay so as a society this is a leading complaint we're not heard okay this is a leading complaint that psychologists deal with okay my sister-in-law uh it's actually their two-year anniversary today okay my younger brother and uh, sister-in-law uh she's a psychologist okay um and uh, th that's the leading complaint she just sits there her job's quite cushy actually you just sit there i watch her and for an hour she might say two words that's it so we need to appreciate the value of listening. Okay, moving on to these, are, and this allows us to establish a rapport. Moving on to another thing that I've picked up, and we've studied different uh, in various versions, but NLP and Dr. Bandler's got the best and the most highest uh, form of mirroring, you can say. Okay, so mirroring is something. Um, it's a, um, where we match someone's or the person we're speaking to the verbal and nonverbal behaviors and communication skills. Okay. Uh, and quite often this is part of a dating science and establishing a rapport, okay, establishing a relationship or a connection with someone. Okay. The first thing you need to do is you need to match your body language with them. If they're sitting down, you need to sit down. If they're standing up, you should be standing down. Okay. Uh, if they've got their arms crossed, you can reciprocate. Okay. You can have your legs crossed if you want. You don't have to do the same thing like a kid. So you look exactly like that, but it needs to be, you know, similar. The next thing is that's the nonverbal. Okay. The body language. The next thing is the vocabulary. Okay. So if you've got a posh patient in the chair, if you've got a patient who uses fancy words, use fancy words. Okay. Uh, if you've got a patient who speaks basic English, use basic English. And this always reminds me of our story with, uh, you know, Sandeep, who was our FD a couple of years ago, and now he's in his uh, 
final year of becoming a prosthodontist at King's College. Okay, uh, he came in about two years ago, and one of my patients was in the chair. His name's Gary. Okay, so Gary's a builder. He's a contractor. Um, he's uh, very well off. He's got, uh, you know, he's having his uh, front teeth basically done, as we call it. Okay, he's having a smile makeover. And I thought I'll get, you know, Sandeep's opinion on the situation, okay, and what he thinks of the mock trying. Okay, so I get Sandeep in and uh, I'm like, uh, Gary, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, all right, mate, how are you doing? Yeah, I want some nice gnashes, man. That's how they speak, okay? So we work in Essex, me and Jin, okay? And they speak like that. So if I, my vocabulary needs to be similar, I don't need to use fancy words. And he speaks with a high volume and he speaks quickly. So I need to speak with a high volume and I need to speak quickly, okay? So if I'm, for example, talking to Jin who speaks quickly and speaks loud, if I then say to Jin, hi, Jin, how are you doing? Yeah, today was stressful. That, it just doesn't, you know, it's not compatible. Okay, so with Gary, he comes in. Uh, I go, Sandeep, what do you think uh, of the mock trine? And Sandeep's like, oh, yeah, I need the juxtaposition of the provisional uh, restorations, uh, very accurate, anatomically accurate. And Gary looks at him completely phased by this sentence, right? Even it took me a while to process the whole information. I mean, because it's like, it's very accurate. But Gary, and Gary said to Sandy, are you all right, mate? Okay. So he completely lost him there. So, I mean, at the same time, when I've got my 90 year old patient, Doris coming in, okay. I, and she's like, hi, Ali, how are you doing? How's mom? How's dad? You know, I need to speak with a low volume. I need to speak slower. Okay. Uh, uh, and match the vocabulary. So we need to match the rate, we need to match the volume, and we need to match the vocabulary, okay? If I, if when Gary comes in and I say to Gary, he's like, hi Ali, how are you doing mate? You all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it's been fun, yeah? And I say to him, hi Gary, how are you doing? You okay? He's gonna be like, Ali's, you know, Ali's not feeling right today, okay? So we need to be able to adapt ourselves. And the final part of mirroring actually, okay, so Dr. Bandler takes it through different stages. So you've got mirror the body language, you've got mirror the voice and the word, words, okay. Uh, the final one is if you can do this, okay, which he made us practice incredibly difficult, is if you can actually match their breathing rate. So the person you're speaking to, if you can match their breathing rate, okay, incredibly difficult. Okay, first thing, it requires a bit of practice. Okay, first thing you need to do is uh, be able to assess someone's uh, breathing rate. And the second thing is to be able to, uh, you know, then have the same breathing rate. Okay, but if you can do that, uh, you'll have an instant true connection. Okay, you can actually hypnotize someone. That's how deep the rapport, the connection can be, uh, if you can do that. So mirroring is uh, definitely... Uh, something that we should be practicing with our patients and doing, especially if we've got virtual consultations, you know, see their body language, see the, how they're sitting and uh, yeah, use that. Now, one thing I'm just going to clarify when you're mirroring, if the patient doesn't speak English, are you shouting louder? Is not <laughs> they understand English. They're not deaf. So just be yeah, hundred uh, translators required depending on where you work. But yeah, you shouting louder is not going to make them understand whatever language you're speaking in. So be aware of that as well. But again, a lot of these tips you probably are understanding is not just for you and your patient. Yeah. Some of you guys may be going on to some interviews or maybe going into new job settings, working with your nurses, working with management teams. Again, all these skills are super essential and really do help to get the whole team to gel and get people on board. And that's what we have applied as well in practice as well. Yeah. So the next thing uh, we're going to cover, okay, is narrative practice, okay? So, so a narrative practice is uh, basically uh, speaking as we do, okay? And this is one of the best tips that I have picked up, okay? So narrative practice is used by uh, many industries, okay? But my favorite one, of course, is a restaurant, okay? When you go to a fancy restaurant, okay? Uh, and I mean, uh, you know what, Jin always comes to my mind for this, okay? Because uh, him and Ria went on a, uh, one of their first dates, okay? And the waiter comes up to him and tells them how they've got uh, truffles at the moment from uh, Italy, okay, with the white truffles and they've been grown up and grown like this and, you know, the benefits of it and how fresh they are. Jin's like, yeah, amazing, amazing. And Jin, you know, orders lots of it, okay, and even the waiter's in shock, okay. But what they're doing when you go to a fancy restaurant, okay, is they are giving you the biography of the food, 
okay, they give you a life history of the food, okay, where it was flown from, it's come from southern Italy, uh, Dr. Vagella, okay, it's, uh, you know, they've used uh, certain pigs to find the uh, truffles and it's the best of the quality, it's the white truffle, and Jin thought, more you put on, the better it must be. Okay, so he went on and uh, put on like 15 grams of this white truffle, okay, and uh, I think the bill, Jin, how much was the bill for that? Yeah, so, I mean, he, he came up with little weighing scales, and I, I <laughs> didn't have a clue what he was doing, and he yeah. goes, uh, tell me when to stop, and he's putting the stuff on, I'm like, yeah, carry on, it's cool, and I think uh, I paid about 190 pounds just for the truffle. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, you, you know, so what they're doing is they're adding value, okay, so what we need to be doing, guys, is we, for certain types of patients, we need to describe the process, okay? So even if you look at, um, if you look at the, like one of my cousins is a very successful uh, car salesman, okay? He sells, buys and sells cars, okay? The difference between his listings and the other listings is it's got tons of information and details there, okay? So you have to give, even when you look at Amazon page, they've got all different types of stats, okay? They've got lots of information and it's the same with us. We need to do narrative practice. Okay, so when you're looking at the patient, you know, you start off, I'm going to have a look at your jaw joints, I'm going to have a look at your lymph nodes, um, and then I'm going to uh, examine your soft tissues for, God forbid, for any cancer or pathology. They need to hear this, okay? And they get more value. All you're doing is adding value to this. The second thing you're doing by this, okay, is the way the brain works. Okay, and this is something we learned in hypnotherapy. Everyone is listening to this lecture right now, okay, the few hundred people that are listening. They're all processing the information with their critical faculty because everyone's conscious, right? So they're listening to the lecture and they're basing it on a couple of things, okay? Uh, they're basing it on which country they're from, their background, their education, whether they like me, whether they like Jin, whether they like Kish, whether they like our appearance, what we're saying. And all of this is being processed and then the information goes inside. However, when you eavesdrop into someone's conversation, and this is how conspiracy theories work, okay? When you eavesdrop into someone's conversation, you're much more, because it's not intended for you, you're much more likely to accept the information. So if we're aware that our patients are listening or eavesdropping into our conversation with our nurse, okay? We can use this as an advantage, okay? So when we're charting, okay? This is the perfect time to tell the patient what they need, okay? So rather than the discussion being, between a filling and a crown or uh, a root canal and an extraction. Okay, when you're charting, you can be right. Okay, so uh, upper right eight is fine. Upper right seven's got a DO amalgam, which is stable. Upper right six is broken down below the gum. It, it, it's not savable. And you're using lay term terminology. A, the nurse can understand what you're saying. And B, more importantly, the patient can understand what you are saying. So you've already said the information once to the patient, okay? So that's how we do narrative practice. And when you say out the information loud, and this is, this is especially important for our junior colleagues, okay, when you start out, uh, it, when you say out the information loud, it allows your brain to improve the processing of the information and it helps your treatment plan, okay? And by doing this, okay, so I've got, you know, I've, I've uh, treat a variety of dentists, okay? Uh, and always have, you know, that's one thing that uh, Sumer, uh, Jin and I met at VT training, okay, and he's our VT trainer, we always said, you know, you've got a decent set of hands, but my communication skills used to let me down. I had three complaints within the first year. Okay, so within the first year, I received three complaints. And he said to me, you need to focus on your communication skills, otherwise you'll be one of them dentists who's just good with the hands and skill, but you won't be able to, you know, treat the patients much, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And hence my communication skills journey started. But I mean, I treat, for example, I treat a consultant orthodontist, uh, I treat an endodontist, uh, an oral surgeon. Uh, but most recently, I've treated a consultant in restorative dentistry. Okay, so that's one of my uh, highest ranking patients, I would say. Okay, she's come in on referral, and we're not, you know, she's 39 years old in the prime of her career. Okay, uh, she's come in for uh, on recommendation to have treatment done. And all I did in order to uh, test this, you remember, Jin, right? When we had this discussion, okay? Uh, when, uh, when the consultant came in, my narrative practice just increased in the detail, okay? So it was like, you know, started off upright eight, distal surface is fine, 
buccal surface is fine, mesial surface is fine, palatal surface is fine, occlusal surface is fine. Seven, the same thing. Distal surface is fine, buccal surface is fine. I'm just saying it out louder. And I went around each tooth. By doing this, by the end of it all, the consultant said to me, that's the most thorough examination she's had. What have I done? I've done exactly what I would normally do. I've just set, said it out more. So it not only works for us, it works on us as well. And I was also sure that because I've said it out loud, I've checked every single thing. It's like a mental template. So narrative practice also works like a uh, you know, mental template for us. Okay, so that's the first time you should be saying the information. The problem we have when we're speaking to the patients is they only remember about 7% of what we say. Okay, so we need to, keep, we need to repeat the information. Re repetition equates to learning. So all educational theory supports that, okay? Uh, same with speaking, okay? So good lecturers will always repeat their content, okay? Hence, guys, I'm going to probably repeat the stuff about 100 times today, okay? But you'll repeat the basic message again and again. So you ideally need to repeat the message three times. So the first time you should be doing is that, okay, to the patient, you know, narrative practice, say in layman terms, say in a treatment plan form, so the patient's eavesdropping into the conversation, taking it on board, okay? Second time is a platform delivery, which is like you summarize all your findings at the end and tell them, you know, I've checked your oral cancer. I've checked your tooth surface loss. I've checked your gums and I've checked your teeth. Okay. And you give them a summary and this is what you need. That's the second repeat. And then you discuss the cost again and that would be the third repeat. And that way the patient take on the information more. Now, couple of, th this is something, you know, uh, Jin's patients always laugh, okay? So two of the best communicators that I know, okay? Like I said, I'm not naturally a good communicator. My younger brother and Jin, both the patients always leaving the room uh, laughing, okay? And this is the study that supports that, okay? In 1997, Professor Levinson, okay, in University of Berkeley, this is one of the foundation studies of communication skills with uh, surgeons, okay? And what he's demonstrated is if you are likely to use humor, if you're likely to use the laughter, okay, with your patients, you're far less likely to get sued. And he basically demonstrated that if you're nice and more approachable, you're less likely to get sued. And our behavior, okay, and our, what we say, short clips, okay, so they, these, are, these are short clips that patients uh, uh, listen, lay people listen to, and they could predict with 75% accuracy which surgeon got sued. So they don't know the qualification. They don't know Jin's got more qualifications than me. They don't know, uh, you know who's got more qualifications than me. They just listen to your consultation and watch our videos and they can predict with 75% accuracy who got sued. And the most important part of the conversation after this is tone, okay? So when it comes to tone of voice, okay, this is just the single most important aspect of verbal communication uh, skill, okay? Now, when I normally ask, you know, what does tone mean to you, okay? So what, what, what does tone represent, okay? It's the emotional state we are in right now. It's a snapshot. It's like social media, you know, it's a snapshot of someone's happiness right there. Same with tone, okay? It's a snapshot of our current emotional state right now. Okay, so we, you know, if you ask, uh, you know, if you ask your uh, partner, or especially, you know, uh, what, uh, wives are experts in this, okay, and Jin and Sumer can vouch for this, okay. Uh, if they say, if you ask them, honey, if, is everything okay? And they go, yes. Everyone knows that yes does not mean a yes, okay. And if you ask them, honey, is everything okay? And they go, yeah, okay. Same words, same verbal response but completely different meanings, okay? And this study is the study that was, again, a groundbreaking study, okay? And this is a fascinating study because it's done by Professor Nalini Ambadi, okay? She's a professor who actually graduated with a degree in psychology in University of Delhi. But she then moved on to Harvard and studied psychology there, had did her social psychology and PhD from Harvard. And she's one of the only Indian professors to teach psychology at Harvard and Stanford. And she's currently a professor of social psychology at Stanford University in California. 
Okay, and she did a study where they blanked out the words of the consultation of surgeons, okay? And the people listened to 20 second clips, 10 second clips at the beginning, 10 second clip at the end, okay? Blanked out the words and all you heard was the tone. Da, 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 da. And again, people were able to identify without, there's no words, there's two 10 second clips, okay? They were able to identify surgeons up to 70% accuracy who got sued. Okay, so tone of voice is key. Okay, but how do we control our emotional state? Okay, because is dentistry a stressful job? Yes, it is. Is COVID added to the stress? Of course it has. Has it added to stress to our patients? Yes, it has. Okay, so we need to be able to control our emotional state and our feelings in order to control our tone. And how do we do that? Okay. We're gonna come on to that in a minute. But when it comes to communication skills, the other thing that I have learned from uh, hypnotherapy is power of suggestion, okay? So quite often there's a, uh, you know, when we have done treatment on our patient and when we fitted it, okay? So before, when you're setting the expectations, that's the first part, okay? So setting expectations is the first part. The patient, um, you know, once you've fitted the treatment, what we want to do is we want to use the placebo effect for us and not against us, okay? So once you've done the treatment, okay, always say to the patient how happy you are. It's gone really well to the plan. Okay, no one wants to hear from the surgeon, oh my God, I tried my best. I'm not sure how it went. If you fitted it and you're happy and you don't have to redo it, then say you're happy with it and it's gone to plan, okay? And what this does, okay, is it increases the healing in the patient. Okay, and this is a randomized control trial, okay, where women had surgery, okay, and they were the, you know, this is a randomized control trial where the group, control group had uh, hypnosis, uh, no, sorry, no treat, they just had antibiotics and painkillers, and the intervention group had hypnosis, antibiotics, and painkillers. Hypnosis was not hypnosis, just power of suggestion, someone telling them you're healing quicker and healing better. And the results were statistically significant which showed that those who were told with the power of suggestion, okay, that you healed quicker and better, they healed quicker and better. That means that the words that come out of our mouth have a physical, physiological result in our patients. So we need to be aware of that. So you say that, use the placebo effect, you know, for you, not against you. So tell them how you're, you know, you're happy with the treatment, it's gone really well. Make sure you are happy with the treatment. Of course, yeah. You put the crown on those open margins, open contacts. Don't say I'm ecstatic of the treatment. Make sure <laughs> it looks the part. If you're doing any composite work, make sure it's the right shade. Again, we do this routinely. Sometimes if I'm really happy with it, I'll call even call Ali in. I go, Ali, look, have a look. What yeah. do you think? And uh, uh, Ali will show his uh, happiness of the treatment as well. But make sure you genuinely do like the treatment you've done and are happy. And I'm sure none of you guys will fit any work in that you're not happy with as well. Yeah, spot on, spot on. Of course, you, that, like I said, you need to be happy with the work, not defective work, okay? Uh, but yeah, happy with the work. Moving on to guys, non-verbal communication skills, okay? So you can see, you can tell that this is 80% of the, uh, you know, communication skills is non-verbal, okay? And a simple, uh, you know, there's lots of techniques that we can use. And one of uh, Jin and mine's favorite technique to use is by uh, President Obama, okay, which is called the closed basket technique, okay? So if I was just to move this here, okay? So when you wanna uh, emphasize uh, or say something of importance to you, okay, or something they should do, you can use this, okay? So, you know, uh, I think you should save the tooth with the root canal and the crown, okay? You can have the tooth extracted. This, the brain is just taking on this more, it means it's important to you and it should be important to them. So you can do a lot of, you know, uh, you can, emphasize stuff like this but you have to be careful in how much palm you show you don't do this okay please save the tooth okay or go for a gold crown that's almost begging okay so that's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's asking too much okay so it's closed basket technique okay and requires practice in front of the mirror okay very simple technique that you can use straight away for your recommended treatment option okay but the most important thing about nonverbal communication skills is we quite often forget the other audience which is us. It's not just our patients, it's us. So our nonverbal communication skills, our body language actually affects us a lot. 
Okay, and we need to be mindful of that. Okay, this is something Prof. Amy Cuddy discusses. And now we're moving on to, you know, neuro-linguistic programming, first part, neuro, okay? The brain, it's our most important organ. How do we keep it healthy? Okay, how do we feel? Okay, so we're talking about tone. It's moving on from tone. At any given point, why do we feel the way we do? Okay, and the answer is, it's down to our neurochemistry, okay? It's down to our hormones, okay? So have we got enough serotonin, dopamine, these things, okay, in our brain, okay? It's, the, it's a chemical imbalance that is, predicts or causes a state of mind or mood we're in, okay? And again, Amy Cuddy, who's one of the most influential uh, social psychologists of recent times, okay? She has said, if you do two minutes of power posing, okay, it increases your testosterone, okay? And she also says, when you pretend to be powerful, you are more likely to feel powerful. Okay, you're more likely to have a presence then. Okay, and when you have a presence, you're more likely to be able to get your values across more. Okay, you come across more authentic. Okay, now the next question is, if power posing causes testosterone, this is the great Dr. Jen doing his clinical teaching at Bart's in the London, you know, level three. Uh, and his all is a, you know, you can tell he hasn't, he's not ready for an FFP3 there. Uh, and he's got a full slick back hair, um, very in 2005 uh, style in fashion for that. Okay. No, I'm joking, Jim. You look good. Uh, but is dentistry uh, power producing, power po is it a power producing posture? Okay, I need to change the words around. The answer is no, it's negative. Okay, it's hunchback, it's closed, it's cortisol producing. No wonder when we leave work, okay, we feel exhausted, it's stressed out. It's our, not only is it the stress of the work, it's our body as well, okay? So we're physically producing cortisol by the work we're doing, okay? So if you're sitting upright, if you're having stretches, it makes all the difference, okay? So my youngest brother is a chiropractor, okay, Siraj, okay? He treats lots of dentists, obviously, all my friends, etc., and he gives us all the same advice. Every 15 minutes, okay, we should be having a break of 10 to 15 seconds, stretch it out, get rid of the lactic acid, and increase your testosterone like that, okay? Get rid of the cortisol. Now, why is testosterone important, okay? It increases our confidence, it increases fertility, increases muscle strength, increases reproductivity, okay? Now, Stags, I know a lot of people, they know what a stag do is, okay, but they don't actually know what a stag is. So a stag is a male deer. This is a fascinating conversation I was having and I was shocked, okay? So if you go to Richmond Park, all right, uh, you can see in the summer right now is, uh, uh, you know, mating season for the stags. So their testosterone levels spike up, okay, and they start fighting, they start creating noise, okay? That's why it's called a stag do, okay? You create a lot of noise, lots of fights, etc. okay, and increase reproductivity. But that's what testosterone does. It increases confidence as well. Now, the relationship between testosterone and cortisol is very interesting. It's exactly like a seesaw, okay? So we know we're increasing our cortisol by dentistry. That means we're reducing our testosterone, okay? But if you control one, you control the other, okay? So if you can't do anything about the cortisol, we can increase our testosterone and that will reduce our cortisol, okay? So it's an inverse relationship. It's like a seesaw. And that's something we need to understand, okay? Now, why is testosterone important? The ultimate aim, okay? If you look at the, uh, any species, okay? The ultimate aim is to reproduce, okay? To reproduce itself. So testosterone is the key ingredient for that, okay? And we'll come back to the significance of that. Now, moving on to other things, okay? Serotonin, okay? Serotonin, these are, you know, as uh, Dr. Banda calls, uh, calls it, okay, these are brain juices, okay? Keep it simple, neurochemistry, brain, neurotransmitters, okay? Serotonin is the happy juice. Now, the thing is, you can't have too much serotonin, all right? So nobody ever goes to the doctor, doc, I'm too happy, you know, I'm way too happy, give me some medication to, you know, make me less happy. There's no limit to the happiness we can feel. But lack of serotonin, causes anxiety and depression, and there's the study for it, okay? Dopamine, lack of it 
It, dopamine is responsible for motivation. It's a natural pain uh, killer. Okay, lack of it causes demotivation, reduced pleasure, and body aches. Okay, that's why quite often depressed patients or people suffering from depression, okay, will have these things. Okay, so we need to be aware of these things. Okay, uh, same. And how do these work? Okay, so when you have a lack of serotonin, when you're depressed, your brain's not producing enough serotonin. Your doctor will give you SSRIs, okay, selective serotonin reuptake in, uh, inhibitors, okay. So it increases medication will increase your level of serotonin, okay. But can we do something that increases serotonin, increases testosterone naturally, okay? And yes, current research shows us that number one, smiles are contagious, okay. It can lengthen our lives, okay and it increases serotonin levels and serves as an antidepressant and a mood lifter okay so if you smile okay as soon as your muscles contract okay your eyes contract your facial muscles contract your brain starts producing serotonin your brain starts producing dopamine now smile is so important okay because it can affect our neurochemistry okay moving on to something linked to smile is laughter why are we attracted to people who make us laugh if you do a survey okay uh when you ask girls what's number one quality that they like or someone who makes me laugh right okay now what's the psychology behind that okay the psychology behind it is okay laughter decreases serum levels of cortisol Laughter is contagious. If I laugh, if I start laughing, it's like, you know, when you get the giggles, okay, and sometimes Jind and I do get the giggles, okay, we're teaching and we start laughing, okay, you start laughing, other people will start laughing, okay, it's contagious and the studies show it, okay, they even showed that you can be sitting in a different part of the room with nothing in common, random people, and very likely if you smile, they will smile back, that's what they've shown in these studies, if you laugh, they can start laughing, it's contagious. If it decreases cortisol level, guys, it increases testosterone level in the male and the female, therefore increases reproductivity. Okay, and that's the ultimate aim of the species. And that's the psychology of why we find people who smile more attractive, why we find people who laugh more attractive, because it increases our testosterone and their testosterone levels are higher, their cortisol levels are lower. Okay. And this study, okay, now the interesting fact about laughter and smiling is the brain can't tell if you're smiling or laughing due to an external stimulus. So you don't have to go to the comedy club or you don't have to watch like, you know, um, uh, you, don't, you don't have to watch anything funny, okay, in order to start laughing. Even if you were just to make laugh and smile for no reason, it's called laughter therapy, it serves the same purpose. Your brain will reduce cortisol level, increase testosterone level, okay, increase serotonin, increase dopamine. And in this case, in this study, it showed that laughter therapy is as effective as antidepressants, okay, for depression and anxiety. Now, the second study is the one that really, you know, took me uh, away, okay? So this is a study done by Hatsi Papas in South Africa, okay, uh, with care workers who are working in low socioeconomic group with AIDS, okay? So these are patients with AIDS and terminal prognosis, okay? And these are volunteer care workers and they were introduced to laughter therapy, okay? 15 minutes a day, five days a week, okay? And participants reported positive emotions after two weeks, positive coping, improved interpersonal relationship and improvement in their care work. Okay, so just no reason because right now with COVID, not many of us have got a lot to laugh about, okay? But if you and your family just get together and start laughing, okay, it'll make, it'll just change your neurochemistry. You'll start producing serotonin, okay? Because all of our serotonin with the stress at the moment is low dopamine is low if you start producing naturally there's no side effects to this okay i'm not telling you to take no happy pills here or anything okay there's no drugs or anything okay if you start laughing for no reason as a family as a group okay or even if you did this before bed and wake up in the morning and you did this okay 
it'll improve your neurochemistry, increase the serum levels of uh, serotonin and dopamine, and it improves your interpersonal relationship. And these, this is, I mean, for these guys, it's like a COVID scenario, 365 days a year. Okay, limited resources in South Africa, uh, and a, you know, terminal prognosis for a lot of the patients. Now, making our mentality more positive is the next one. Okay, how do we become more positive? Okay, well, initially you have to force yourself. Okay, so if you're, you know, you can look at a cup, cup okay, if it's half empty or half full, if it's half empty, force yourself and initially it'll be fake. Okay, you're not going to feel, oh, you know, like COVID right now, why are you going to be grateful? Why are you going to be happy with a lot of the situation that's going on? A lot of us missing out on a lot of stuff, okay? But if you start only focusing on the positive, you start being grateful. Initially, it will be fake, but it'll ultimately lead to gratitude. Okay, and again, it changes your neurochemistry and you will become positive. So you actually, it'll be fake. I'm not saying it's going to, I'm not telling you it's going to be natural, but you'll, you're forcing yourself, actually. You keep on saying it to yourself, I'm grateful about this, okay? Uh, and you start becoming positive. And the biggest advantages of this is no envy and no jealousy. It just keeps your neurochemistry healthier, okay? And an amazing way that people do this, okay? So in different cultures do this, okay? So on the left, you can see, there's a snapshot of an Indian orphanage, okay? And they're just happy with basic food and they're grateful for that, okay? And on the right, we've got people who used to, you know, uh, and I love this, okay? You know, saying mass, saying grace before starting food, okay? And you have to remember quite often it used to be just bread and a bit of soup, okay? Not like our lavish meals right now, okay? Uh, and you can start being grateful for the smallest of things, okay? And the, all of these things have huge psychological benefits and it improves our neurochemistry. If our neurochemistry is better, our tone is better, our relationship and decision makings are better. Okay. Moving on to more of the other stuff. Okay. So self hypnosis. What is self hypnosis? Okay. It's basically access to the control board of our brain. And in anxiety, okay, uh, in stress, we've got too many apps open. So, you know, for the younger generation, that's how I have to explain. Okay, we've got too many apps open. You have to, you know, close all the apps. Okay, up, 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 close all the apps, all right? So that's what self-hypnosis does. And all you have to say to yourself is, I'm going to put myself in a relaxed state of mind. Okay, and I'm going to count to one to 10. And at 10, I'm going to be at my most relaxed, favorite place of relaxation. It can be your beach, your holiday, wherever. And you just give yourself a break for a couple of minutes, 10 minutes, and come back. I've been on some very expensive courses, and this is what they taught. Okay, I already knew this, but they just went on a long-winded, uh, you know, uh, tour of this whole technique, okay? And it works, and you can program, your, program yourself in many ways, okay? Now, when you're talking to yourself, and when you're talking to our patients, okay, one word which I will ask all of you to take away from today, and never to use again, is try, okay? So, well done, you tried, Jin. What does that mean? I failed. You failed. Yeah, I mean, we, we basically have these words. The brain recognizes the word tried equating to failure, okay? So when we say to our patients, I've tried my best, they, the brain, one thing I learned from Dr. Bandler, okay, he's got four PhDs, very smart dude, okay, is our brain only understands information in big chunks. Yes, no, good, bad, okay? So when you're, you know, coming out with a lot of information, you're confu you can confuse the patient. But if you say, I've tried my best, you're telling the patient's brain, I have failed my best. So don't use the word try. And also do not, ladies and gentlemen, use the word try when you're speaking to yourself. Okay, if you're speaking to yourself and you're going to say, I'm going to try to lose weight. Okay, you're saying I'm going to fail to lose weight. So how about we just cut the word try out? Okay, I'm going to lose weight. There's no side effects to this. Just cut the word try out in your internal dialogue and with your patients and it makes everything more positive. Okay, so biggest thing, he was like, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, do or do not do, there is no try. Yoda's famous saying from the 70s film or Star Wars film, okay? And it's true. There's no try. You either do it or you don't do it. And same with dentistry when we're talking to our patients. And more importantly, with ourselves, okay? 
So just change it. No, no difference is going to happen. Okay. But I've had so many people who argue with me. I can't say that to myself. You know, I have to tell myself to try. I go, how about you just say, I'm going to do it. And just cut the word try out. There's no side effects. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> you know, there is no, it's a lot of psychological inhibition here. Uh, but cut the word try out from your vocabulary. And it's the biggest, that's one thing, okay. Uh, out of the thousands of pounds I spent on that course, that was the biggest thing I took away is cut the word try out from your whole vocabulary. Now it's good Ali's touched on that topic of try. Uh, this is our last webinar we've had. Ricardo Amanato from Italy, Marcus Blatt, Finlay Sutton, all these guys, when they're deciding what treatment to do, there is no trying. Mm. And even when they went through all the options and everything, they either do the treatment or it's a decision, the tooth needs to come out or it's something else. But it's very mm. decisive what they do, uh, very objective as well with the procedures they're doing it. And this is something for you younger guys, I would say it comes with time and with experience. Even when we initially started, when I was a uh, young FD with uh, in Sumir's practice, I tried uh, a lot of heroic dentistry. And as you proceed and as you learn more stuff, as you do more courses and more knowledge, your decision making clinically will be either we do it or we don't do it. And that's one thing which uh, Ali covered as well. And I was trying to remove that word try from your vocabulary. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and especially guys, look, when you're setting the patient's expectations, you can, if you're not sure, say, I can try. Once you've done the treatment and it's finished in the mouth, no need to say, I've tried. Then I've done it. Okay, I've done it. It's gone well. Okay, so that, that's number one. Number two, when you're, especially, you know, you're right. At the beginning of your career, even more important, cut the word try. I'm going to try to become a good dentist. I'm going to try to become, you know, better at, my personal relationships or communication skills or dating or dancing or sports. Okay. Just cut the word, try out. Okay. And just say, do it. And it just changes the whole programming and your uh, system of your brain. That's what happens. Just when you're talking to yourself, don't use the word try, because if you use the word try, you're programming failure into your own brain. That's what happens. Okay. Now moving on. Yeah. Now I know a lot of you guys are thinking I signed up to a, webinar on dentistry and here's Ali talking about relationship advice and how to do family planning. The most important thing as you will learn with communication skills is not who's in front of you, not the patient, not your wife or husband, it's yourself. And as much as we've done courses, the more you understand yourself, the more you can control your own mind, the easier it will be to put these, all these techniques into place. So super important what Ali was talking about. And we're going through the chemistry of evidence of how to get ourselves geared up to be right for the patient. As Ali was saying, it's our mindset. Yeah. Similar to it's not just our, it's a mindset. It's also if we've got a positive neurochemistry, okay? So if someone came in and gave you a shot of adrenaline, your heart's going to start beating. You're going to be ready to fight or flight, okay? Someone gave you an antidepressant or an SSRI, you're going to become happier. So why not increase our serotonin levels, dopamine levels, testosterone levels naturally with these techniques, okay? So then our tone and our decision-making, everything becomes more positive. It's a known fact. If you're happier, you learn more. If you're happier, you make decisions better. And this is when they mean happier, okay? They mean your blood chemistry is all good, okay? So they, they measure it like that, okay? So it's very scientifically proven techniques okay not wishy-washy stuff here it's all scientifically physically physiologically proven okay now moving on to the final part okay of uh, tonight's uh, um, lecture is the programming so we've done neuro we started off with linguistics we've done neuro and now the programming okay so uh, for fears anxieties phobias bad memories you know all of this we carry this weight across okay if you have a failed extraction if you have a failed relationship okay move forward we carry that baggage that burden guilt with us okay and what happens is our brain will make movies pictures and store them there okay that's how our brain works okay so that's the film that uh, if uh, if we're the audience that's our film so if we think of you know if uh, if i did an extraction last week and i couldn't get it out I'm going in to see, do another extraction. It might be difficult. I'm not, my brain's playing this movie, okay, that you won't be able to get it out and it's got fear, might have a sound or not. 
Now, how can we use this? Okay, what does that mean? Okay, so there's two basic, very basic technique I'm going to show you. Okay, is for phobias, for example, it's called the visual squash. Okay, so if you ask most people, are you scared of spiders? So a lot of people are scared of spiders. They start jumping up and down. And when you ask them how big the spider, if I tell them there's a spider next door, they'll start getting scared. Even though I might be lying, there's no spider next door. And when you ask them how big the spider is, the spider's about that big. Like I've never seen spiders that big. Okay, spider's about bigger than what it is on your screen right now, okay? But if you say to yourself, you say, I'm gonna, you know, just close your eyes, imagine the picture, and you just reduce the size. This is called a visual squash, okay? For spiders and make it into a spider shape or if it's heights, okay? Reduce the height. You get rid of the anxiety, okay? You make it more realistic. A lot of our phobias and fears are just bigger pictures in our brain, okay? Uh, you just, if you make it smaller, it's called the visual squash technique. That's for phobias. But more importantly, okay, we can use it in dentistry for visual is called visual expansion okay so this is something i've learned so one of the things that so how nlp came about right dr bandler he studied psychologists he's a mathematician by the way he, and who studied the behavior of, of psychologists and hypnotherapists hence it's very logical it's process driven okay and visual expansion is another technique okay so he well, if you ask someone who's good at carving so for example janus okay so how does he teach carving okay the teeth are this big all right so when you're doing your carving okay so this is one of the amalgams that i did for my fd hamish a couple of years ago there's a couple of fds around and live demo okay it did it and it's been there for about five six years now okay and they asked how how do you see it it's so small okay so yeah that's the size of the tooth on the left but in my head it's this big where did i learn this from i learned this from janus I learned this from Jin because I always ask him. Jin's like, yeah, yeah, it's that, like that big, isn't it? You know, the truth's that big. And, you, you know, you can carve it like that. And more, you know, and again, you know, when I look at, uh, for example, crown prep was another one, okay? So, you know, we've got the smooth crown preps going on at the moment, okay? And with these super smooth margins, okay? And one of the best crown preppers I know, okay? Like amazing crown preppers is one of my very good friends, Muj. Okay, Muj, Muj Dabar Degenpur super amazing crown preps and i was like much how do you get your margins so sm super smooth right and he's like ali it's really good like you know it's i just imagine a slippery slope super slippery slope as a margin and the margins are that big and i was like you know what it makes sense so when you're trying to do crown preps or when i like for example talk to kish and i'm like kish how do you get your smile design so good he's like you, you know and I was talking to him and he made it out like, you know, the smile's that big in front of him, okay? And you can work this, you can tweak that. If you just expand what you're working on, because what we work on, the surgical field is very small. If you just mentally make it bigger when you're carving, have the tooth bigger, have the smile design bigger, have the crown prep, like the slippery slope, Dr. Muji's style, okay? And you know what? My preps, it just made sense. It connects. And Janos, that's why he's such a good teacher, because he physically makes us expand the carving and that's why i've learned so much from him okay uh, and that's why the carvings like that uh it's from his course right you know because he makes you practice on these big teeth okay and you uh, draw it out practice it and that's what you need okay so you need to for uh dentistry if it looks really small root canals look really small when i talk to neha you know i go how do you find these canals or how do you negotiate and for her the canals look that big i'm like i don't know what you know you're treating elephants or something but yeah the canals seem that big to her Okay, but it makes sense. If you visually expand it, okay, it, it will make sense. Okay, so that's a, a, a NLP technique improves our brain processing function. Okay, now guys, last, we're closing up, wrapping up today's session. Okay, I'm going to ask you all a question. Okay, how do you feel when your patients tell you that they don't brush their teeth two minutes twice a day because they don't have time or they don't believe in it? What's our thoughts as dentists? Just think about that, okay? Now, what I'm gonna ask you to do, guys, I'm gonna ask you for the same thing. I'm gonna ask you for, okay? I'm gonna ask you for four minutes a day, two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the evening, and guess what? You can even do this. Best time to do this is right before, uh, as soon as you wake up and before 
you go to sleep. In your bed, there's no cost. I mean, with us, we have to ask our patients to buy toothpaste and floss and stuff. There is no cost to this. There's no side effects to this. Even if you don't believe in fluoride, like some of my patients, that's fine. You don't need to believe in anything apart from just smiling, okay? And if you smile, laugh, power pose, let's do it together for two minutes, twice a day, it will increase naturally your testosterone levels, which will make you look more attractive, okay? Uh, make you more confident, increase your serotonin levels. Okay, guess what? If your serotonin levels go below a certain level, you will become, it's, that's what depression is, okay? But you can't have too much serotonin, so don't worry. If you reach a stage that you've got too much serotonin, please give me a call. I wanna know the secret as well, okay? So if you've got too much serotonin, from doing these exercises and you're having happiness side effects, definitely. Because okay, so let's not be one of our annoying patients and smile two minutes twice a day. Now, a lot of people are hesitant to this, but guess what? Okay. If I put this picture up, everyone's all like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the smile specialists. We just like talking about smile designs. Now, there are studies out there that show if you have a more attractive smile, you're more likely to be hired you're more likely to get a pay rise. You're more likely to have a successful date and get married and have better relationships. These are studies out there, okay? And it's all, I think, a lot of it, if you've got an attractive smile, you're more likely to smile. And because it's contagious, you're more likely to increase their testosterone levels, okay? And be more reproductive, ultimately. Now, psychology today, these are clinically proven effects of smiling and laughing more makes us more attractive, okay? So they did an MRI scan. They showed uh, people pictures of people they found attractive, okay? So for example, a lot of, uh, you know, in uh, the, you know, in 2000s when Jin was an up and uh, struggling Bollywood actor, okay? Uh, you know, a lot of girls used to fancy him. So if they did an MRI scan of Jin, them watching Jin's picture, okay? They would have shown that their brain's activity is quite high. But if Jin smiled, the brain activity in the pleasure center and the serotonin centers increased. These are MRI scans, okay? So increases, elevates our mood. If you've got more dopamine, we're more likely to have better immune system, lowers our blood pressure, makes us feel good. People who smile more are more likely to live longer. And they predicted this from pictures. And that's one of the studies I had, up, okay? So they could look at pictures and the amount of smile you had predicted your average age before, you know, how long you would live. Makes you more successful and helps you stay positive. These are, this is all from Psychology Today, the magazine. So we're gonna finish this off, okay? And uh, for those of us who are really struggling, okay, miserable gets amongst us, okay? Uh, there is a meta-analysis, okay? Uh, which actually shows that people who smile more are happier. It's a known fact, a meta-analysis. I'm not going to a randomized control trial or a systematic review. It's a meta-analysis from 2019. Okay, and if you really can't, uh, you know, smile, um, you know, then guys, this is the link. It's only four pounds, okay? And who said money can't buy you happiness? It's only four pounds and get delivered, okay? Uh, it's actually a screenshot. You can buy it from Amazon, okay? So they sell this stuff, okay? So I'm gonna ask you, we're gonna finish our uh, exercise by just smiling for two minutes. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to put your hands up. It's a power pose and smile for two minutes, okay? And you smile with your eyes, that's it. Put your hands up, increase your testosterone levels, okay? And keep them up and keep smiling, okay? And that will help improve our neurochemistry, okay? And if our tone is better, the ultimate, what did all the studies show? If our tone is better, Okay, I don't like the way he spoke to me. Okay, that's tone. All of these complaints are tone related. If our neurochemistry is better, if our tone is better, our relationships are better, we're more likely to be successful, we're more likely to be happier, okay? And we're more likely to be, uh, patients are more likely to go for treatment as well. And we are the smile experts. That's what I don't understand. We're happy to sit here, learn about smile design, okay? But do we know the psychological benefits, the holistic benefits of smiling? Okay. So, and if you say that, that's what me and Jin do. Okay. So there's a big difference, right? So when our patients say, you know, it'll make me feel more confident. 
will tell them, yeah, of course, all the studies showed your testosterone levels will go up. You're more likely to feel more confident if you have an attractive smile because you'll smile more. Okay, so that's my advice. Okay, and I'm going to finish off this saying, uh, finish off today's lecture. Every act of goodness is a charity, even if it's just a smile. It's by Prophet Muhammad. Okay, peace be upon him. So smiling is key in lots of things. Okay, so I hope this was useful. All the tips, they're instantly, readily available, and it helps you uh, improve your neurochemistry, especially with COVID. Improves. There's no side effects to any of it. You know what? Guess if you smile and laugh, okay, it might be a bit socially unacceptable, but there's no side effects, okay? There's no cost to it. If you don't like it, stop it, okay? But there's nothing stopping you from using all of these techniques, okay? Improving our neurochemistry. Use the, you know, what we've discussed in narrative practice. That's an amazing technique. Find out what processing system they are. You know, Jin, that sounds, uh, you know, painful. And uh, so when you're talking about how does the treatment cost, okay? So how does that sound to you? If they're auditory, if they're visual, how does that look to you? Okay, does that feel okay? If they're kinesthetic, so you can, it, and if you do that, it automatically improves your rapport and connection with someone. Okay, it's like a lightning cable, okay, USB fast charger, rapid charger. Okay, you instantly get that connection. You know, you, sometimes you just connect with someone, it's all because you're talking on the right level. So, quite often, the the difference we get between, you know, uh, in a couple is uh, wives will be like, or girlfriends will be like, boyfriend doesn't understand, okay? Or my fiance doesn't understand, okay? And guess what? She's asked him, what do you think of the holiday? He's visual and she is auditory. So, or she's kinesthetic. And he says, you know, that sounds like, like a good, that looks like a good plan. Good, looks like a good hotel. It doesn't register. She goes, oh, he doesn't understand. But if he goes, oh, yeah, you know what? I like the look of that. That looks like a good deal. And she's visual. You've got the connection. Okay. Or that sounds like a good hotel. She's auditory. You've got the connection. Or if they like majority of the girls in, uh, you know, it might be a kinesthetic thing where it's a feeling uh, connection. Okay. So, you know, yeah, it feels good. I like the feel of the hotel. Oh, you know what? He really gets me. He's on my level. Okay. And it's the same with our patients. With our patients, it's very easy to find out because they quite often describe their fears in the way. So if we pick that up and repeat it to them, we establish this connection with them, okay? And increases the report, increases the satisfaction. Make sure when they're eavesdropping, you ask them, uh, you know, uh, you say all the stuff to them without it being critiqued. That's why I would say this. So these are all the things, you know, in an hour, or actually it's been more than an hour. Okay, in a quick nutshell, a couple of things that we picked up and there's obviously lots more. Okay. Absolutely fantastic, Ali. Thank you so much. An absolutely amazing uh, lecture and insight into all the aspects of communication skills, but more importantly, NLP. And what I love about it is how we can work on ourselves, especially yeah. with the current climate, all of us in the dental profession are going through a difficult time with all this COVID, yeah uncertainty with the NHS, a uh, lot yeah. going on. I think this is so important uh, with what you've gone through. And even since you've taught me a lot of these skills and I've been applying it uh, in practice in life, it's been amazing. So genuinely appreciate your input and uh, what you went through today. Always picking up. No, my pleasure, man. Like I said, when we go into Richard Bandler's uh, talk, okay, he's a funny guy. He's from Southern Texas. He's 80 years old. He swears a lot. He's super racist, super sexist. F's and blinds, he's from Texas, okay, he supports Donald Trump, okay, he's a unique character. When you sign up for the course, you have to sign a disclaimer. But one thing he did make us do every single day is you have to smile for two minutes in the morning, first thing when he starts his talk, and after lunch, he makes a smile. Two minutes, twice a day, and he goes, it just improves your learning and everything. And I was sitting there and just thinking, smiling's our speciality. If we are not smile specialists, I don't know who is. Okay, if dentists aren't the smile specialists, I don't know who else is. So it, we really need to know the psychological uh, parts as well. That totally makes sense, right? We're creating smiles, but if we're not, we don't know the process behind what a smile actually does to you emotionally and physically as well, then are we really providing a full service for our patients? Say so you're going to give them their confidence back, but if we're doing that, we should know how to do that, not just by creating a smile with, the, with ceramic or composite, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it more holistic. Yeah, 100%.
And one of the things I wanted to say is that what I loved about your lecture, there's so many little gems of information there, but it was all evidence-based. I've heard a yeah. lot of communication lectures. I love the fact that everything was communication-based. And see, we go through university, we're never taught, there's no real em emphasis on communication skills. It's all about the technical, how to yeah. do this opposite really well, how to do that cram prep really well. So yeah. we come out of university just thinking, all right, fine. All we've got to do is be able to do the clinical skills really well. Yeah. And if we do uh, patients in that way, in a way they understand, you know, there's going to be problems. And you said like 80 to 90% of the complaints happen as a result of communication yeah. skills lacking. Yeah, I mean, Kish, look, my other, you know what, I've, I've actually discussed this with several universities so far, and I'm going to start my campaign. I'm going to, you know, extend it here as well. I have a massive issue with university and our education system not teaching us how to discuss money and fees. Okay, if we teach, if they taught us how to discuss money and fees, okay, we won't have any problems. We'll learn in a day. Okay, we're not taught. It's a taboo subject. Okay, guess what? Even people, so when I'm looking at Sandeep and I'm looking at Neha, okay, these are specialists, okay? They're ever only going to work in private practices, high-end practices, everything's in the thousands, okay? They've never had a single day on the psychology of discussing money. How should you say it? What does the patient go through? The stages the patient goes through when the money cost is too much, okay? If we're taught this, if universities start doing this, It'll, it'll save us so much trouble and complaints, okay? And this is one of the things that, you know, I think we should all learn is how to discuss costs and fees and the psychology behind it, okay? And universities actually have a good role. I mean, as a, even as a specialist, if we're not taught that, then I don't know. Again, they're only going to work in private practice. Even, even so. more so now that patients are coming back to a lot of our practices. I mean, yeah. the small group, we're not, but a lot of practices, you're charging them 35, 40 pounds for PPE. Yeah. And again, the skill to tell the patient, I'm going to charge you now for PPE, whereas last yeah. year, we were just chucking PPE at your face. Uh, yeah. Again, these little skills that you need to pick up on how to deliver this to the patient, because it's the current climate we're in, money is a massive, massive thing. Discuss yeah. the patient. It's going to be yeah. extra sensitive as well. Yeah, I mean, and that's exactly, you know, when we train practices, okay, uh, to like, you know, when they ask us to come in and teach them, uh, how to discuss this that, that you know it's just making it more of a natural process rather than an alien thing and the dentist feels uncomfortable as soon as you feel uncomfortable you start doing certain movements with your eyes and facial expressions which make the patient think you're lying and makes you untrustworthy so you just need to overcome that yeah but that ties in exactly to what you said before and I know you teach this on a lot of your courses is that yeah. again Finn said it starts with you so if yeah. you can ground yourself emotionally yeah. then that honesty and everything you're trying to say comes out a bit more, a bit better with the patient, right? Yeah, 100%, 100%, yeah. Brilliant. So Ali, we've got a couple of questions here. Yeah. Do you want to go through the questions? Yeah, so we've got um, Satyam here who says, uh, who's asking, should you specifically mirror when breaking bad news? Or is now the time to lower the volume, slow the speed down, increase the seriousness of the tone? No, it depends on the intensity and the seriousness of the bad news, okay? But generally speaking, when it's bad news, okay, you should deliver it instantly, okay? Don't extend the sugarcoat the bad news, all right? Don't sugarcoat the bad news, um, and you should deliver it instantly, and yeah, lower the tone, slow tone, empathetic, like you're feeling the pain and the, uh, you know, uh, loss with them, basically, okay? uh so yeah i've uh, i've been in uh consultations actually unfortunately i've been into the uh hospital where they've uh told uh patients or uh, you know that they've got terminal cancer and i've seen how it's done okay and it's yeah it needs to be done empathetically but it needs to be done swiftly yeah i think empathy there is probably the most important thing because again yeah. that's your tone of voice if you have if you feel empathy then your seriousness and your and your tone yeah. of voice will come naturally right yeah so you need to yeah it's uh, they're right slow uh, uh, lighter volume slower a softer tone okay uh, i'm really sorry you know uh, and this and just make sure your part like you know you're there to uh, reciprocate and feel or carry some of the pain with them depending on the seriousness of the pain if it's like you know patients got perio and nobody told them that they've uh, had perio and they smoke 40 a day uh, for the past uh, 20 years, okay? Yeah, tell them, let them be, and you have to allow the patient 
to process the information okay so this is another thing that we do uh, talk about okay is that when you when you deliver bad news the patient's going to go through five phases okay denial okay the second is anger third is bargaining fourth is depression and fifth is acceptance okay and the greater the trauma the big, the worse the bad news the longer this stage these stages will take okay and this the same psychology actually that we go through after a breakup or anything else okay so it's uh, but it's the same for bad news it's for grievance perfect okay. thank you i've got a question ali in terms of yeah. uh, how you're quite talking about serotonin dopamine uh, yeah. saying obviously smiling increases that what about food intake wise is there anything we can eat or yeah. drink or we can get naturally yeah food food intake wise okay so you know obviously you know this is my uh uh, absolute passion is uh, natural foods and stuff. Okay, so uh, number one is uh, vitamin D. Okay, uh, omega threes. Uh, these are absolutely key. Okay, um, make sure. I mean, at the moment, obviously, it's not. Guys, those of you who are listening from abroad, I know we've got a lot of international uh, delegates. Okay, uh, it's quite cold here at the moment. Okay, <laughs> we don't have. Uh, but if you have the sun, you need about twenty minutes of uh, sunlight, and it increases your vitamin D. But there's lots of things that you can have that increase uh, your uh, mind state. Okay, and one of the herbs that I take personally, okay, is uh, called ashwagandha, which is an Indian medication. Okay, uh, I take uh, it's a root extract. It's like ginger, uh, and it reduces cortisol levels. Uh, you can have it as tea, or you can have it as tablets. So I take tablets. Yeah. There you go. Food yeah. dietary analysis advice as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Any other questions at all? Let me have a quick look. I don't think we have. There might be one more. Let's see. Let's have a look. I've got a question, Ali. If um, I know you uh, touched upon the subject of you know when someone's trying to lose weight, the word "try" comes into mind. Yeah. In terms of yourself, obviously you said it's a shift in mindset. Dropping the yeah. word "try." When yeah. someone's trying to go for that sort of mindset, what is the most important piece of advice that you could give them, changing their mindset? Uh, the, the, uh, most in, the most important thing there is literally write that out, okay? So I'm going to try to lose weight. Cut the word try out and just say, I'm right, I'm going to lose weight. Okay, so it's like my high school detention center Okay, so when I used to get detentions in high, uh, high school from my science teacher, she'd make me write, I will not be late again. Okay, and if she knew now I'm still late 20 years on, she, I suppose she'll be laughing or not. But, uh, you know, and you just basically cut the word try out and write, I will lose weight. That's it. Okay, and write that a few times and then you say it. Okay, and once you just eliminate the word try, and that's a good practical way of doing it. And this is exactly what we did in NLP. Okay, so we just we wrote the word out. I can't do this, okay? Mm -hmm. So you basically extend it to, I cannot do this, and you cut the not out, okay, and say, I can do this, okay? So, and you basically write it out, and then you do lines, and then you say it, and it makes the difference. I guess by writing out, you almost visualize exactly what you want, and then yeah. you start believing. Right? 100%, as soon as you start, I mean, so, you know, if we're talking about gratitude and being grateful, so I am grateful for, if you can't be grateful for anything, being alive, waking up today, okay, with COVID uh, going on and with so many uh, people suffering and having health issues, okay, I'm grateful for having this meal, okay? If you write it, if you put pen to paper, if you type it, okay, as soon as there's a physical act to it, you be it becomes more imprinted, imprinted in your brain. Perfect. So that's a, that, that physical processes will make your uh brain more attached to the whole process it creates a programming effect it's a programming uh, uh, uh format the physical change of mental state yeah yeah perfect fantastic just check uh, so it. i've got this uh it's called ashwagandha so it's uh, from one of the delegates a uh, a s h uh Okay. And I get it from a company called Nutravita. Not that I'm sponsoring them or anything. It's just a British made company, British made product. So I just, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's why I use that. Perfect. Now, a lot of you guys are probably thinking, what was our journey and 
how do we start all this? I mean, Ali and myself, we've met the same FD practice uh, with Samir Khan. And since then, there's a lot of post-grad stuff, a lot of clinical stuff, but we've done a lot of stuff on communication skills. So Ali, as he said, is a master practitioner in NLP. He's, we've done a PG cert in dental education, another PG cert in leadership, coaching, mentoring. And Ali's also done a diploma, a clinical diploma in hypnosis. It, yeah. So I mean, uh, look, the key thing for me in all of this, like I said, I'm not a natural communicator. Okay, for me, this was the thing that I had to focus on. Um, and initially, I still remember when I, when I was in high school, um, I went to my, my careers counselor, I was 14 years old, okay, and I said that I want to be a dentist. Okay, now in my family, there are no dentists. I'm the first person to go to university from my family, okay? Uh, so uh, she's like, you don't sound like a dentist don't look like a dentist, you should become a nurse, okay, those of you who know me, I'll be the worst nurse ever, okay, uh, again, went to another careers counselor, a regional one, she said the same thing, okay, and it's true, my communication skills were poor, okay, uh, so now for me to have reached a state where I now, you know, I've delivered this at national conferences uh, with hundreds of dentists there, uh, and to reach this stage, and it's not something that's come naturally, it's all taught skills, okay, and all the studies show, okay, that these skills can be easily taught in a day or two, okay, there's social psychologists, not me, social psychologists, professors of social psychology are doing studies, okay, same, uh, you know, uh, Professor Nalini Ambadi, okay, in the University of Stanford has shown this, surgeons can be taught this in two days, day or two, they can improve their communication skills, that's a simple technique, so it can make all the difference. Absolutely fantastic. So there are no further questions. What I want to say is a big thank you to Ali for amazing insight uh, and the pure insights you gave into the main bits of communication skills, patient management, but more importantly, what we can do within ourselves for our lives as well. So genuine appreciation. If any of you uh, want to reach out to Ali, Ali is on Instagram or Facebook, uh, Dr. Ali Smile. So do uh, uh, add him on Instagram. Uh, message him any questions you got or when his next lectures of course are he'll more than happy to help you out and also send you the links uh to the journals as well and yeah, 100 any go for it i'm i'm happy to answer any questions anyone's got anything i've already had a couple of questions you know what books can i read uh a great book to uh read is uh thinking on purpose okay by dr richard bandler uh you know he's a it's it's a very good book it explains a lot of uh, nlp stuff um, and yeah, I would say, uh, I'm happy to share any of these journals. If you just Google it, okay. Just rather than say writing dental journals, write smile, uh, journals. Okay. All right. Or, or effects of smiling. And you'll be surprised at how many psychology journals come up. Fantastic. So this brings us to the end of a 10 week webinar series, uh, taking us through the lockdown. It's been absolutely fantastic. We've had some fantastic clinical stuff, finishing on a very important subject, uh, which is how we're going to improve ourselves. Kish, how's it been for you? Uh, it's been great. I said, like, like I said at the beginning, 10 weeks has flown past. Uh, we initially, when we planned this, it was only going to be a five uh, webinar series, an international series, but it was so popular. We had so much demand for it. That's why we decided to run for the whole 10 weeks. But I just want to say thank you to Ali again for ending the series on such a positive note obviously up until now it's all been a lot of clinical stuff but you know mental health and well-being is a massive um, massive thing right now especially with lockdown and being um, at home and not being able to do what we do what we love to do so i just want to say thank you very much for ending on such a positive note uh, on this uh, webinar series no my pleasure man uh, like i said communication skills if you can't communicate well, even if you can do good dentistry, you can't do it on patients. So it's the connection between us and the patients. So definitely, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I've actually enjoyed every single one of the lectures. They've actually been great. Uh, all for free, it's just to help out everyone. And uh, we don't, like I said, we don't hold back on the tips or the advice, okay? It's, uh, it's the content and there's plenty more content, okay? So uh, it's been a pleasure and hopefully, it, it improves everyone's neurochemistry and you lot become happier. Otherwise, four pounds on Amazon, guys. Okay, get yourself that smile, uh, smile maker. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Jim. Also, before I forget, Jim, just before I forget, I just want to say thank you to Jim for all the tunes at the beginning of every single webinar. It's made a whole, diff whole huge world of difference. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, DJ Jim. 100%. 100%. So, I mean, those of you guys, if you're not following us already on social media, or Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, do follow us. All these webinar series will be up there for you to follow. And the most important thing we've learned from lockdown is make sure you join your lives. And we're trying to do our philosophy uh, with a smile group. And now you realize why we're called Smile. Is uh, yeah. there evidence behind it in chemistry and why we call ourselves uh, Smile Dental Academy and Smile Clinic Group. Make sure you are enjoying your lives. What we've learned is life is too short. Our motto is always work hard, but play much harder. And always be gratitude to the small things, such as each other, family, loved ones, friends, uh, and being alive. So if anyone needs any support, we are all here. Uh, reach out to us. There's a number of us guys out there uh, supporting each other, uh, especially our mentor, Samir Khan, who has instilled that you know, support uh, philosophy from day one. So we support each other as a profession. That's the only way we're going to progress as well. So yeah. that is us signing us off. Make sure you're enjoying yourselves. Any help you need. But most importantly, as Ali said, is smile. So guys, smile. have a great week. <laughs> and again, we'll be uploading that. Boys, peace out. Thank you so much, guys. Take care, guys. God bless. Look after yourself.